And welcome to the Tax-Free Growth with Roth IRA Investments. I'd like to put up the slide uh, that the Entrance Group does not provide investment advice or endorse any products. All information and materials are for educational purposes only. Our parties, all parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investments. All right, now that we got that uh, out of the way, uh, the reason why we created this course is that one of the most common questions that I, that I get is, uh, <clears throat> what is the difference between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA? This course will be focusing on the benefits of a Roth IRA and um, you know what, what characteristics does it have and, and uh, wh why should one consider a Roth IRA? Uh, we're going to talk about the characteristics of a Roth. How do you fund a Roth IRA? How do you, how do you put money in a Roth IRA? And what are the limits? Um, what, what's permitted and not permitted investments? in a Roth IRA, uh, how does the IRS know that if there are tax benefits in a Roth, how does the IRS know? In other words, we're gonna take a look at how, how items are reported uh, or uh, such as distributions to the IRA. And then we'll open up the phones for any questions you may have in regards to the material presented. Again, my name is John Paul Ruiz, Director of Professional Development at the Entrust Group. Um, I have over 29 years of retirement plan education. But I enjoy these particular types of seminars because I get to speak to you, the audience, the, the users of these particular retirement plans, and hopefully we can answer uh, the questions you may have to spark some interest in regards to participating in a particular program that may be uh, beneficial to you. Uh, we uh, would like to start off a little bit about talking about the Entrust Group. The Entrust Group is what we call a self-directed IRA administrator. So unlike other IRA providers, we actually allow for a broader array of investments that can be held under your retirement plan. Uh, Self-directed administrators do not offer any investments, but in turn offer the offers the platform that would allow for you to have a retirement plan, number one, and keep those particular assets tax deferred. In other words, enjoy the tax benefits of the retirement plan because of the interest group. In other words, without the interest group, you, you, know, you won't be able to enjoy the tax benefits of a retirement plan. In other words, unlike regular accounts, a self-directed administrator allows for you to enjoy the uh, re uh, retirement plan benefits by engaging with the interest group. We have over $4 billion of assets under administration, 22,000 active accounts. And the, the thing that, we, um, that, that separates us from the rest is that we have over 40 years uh, of uh, of service. In other words, we've been around for for a long time. As well as whereas other organizations are automating everything, we do have bodies that can actually answer the, your calls and even consult with you, and that you can engage with in regards to having an account at the Entrust Group. Again, we are self directed IRA administrator. We have knowledgeable staff, which uh, a lot of our staff actually has what we call the CISP designation the Certified IRA Services Professional Designation through the American Banking Association. We have nationwide offices, and we also hold in-person events and virtual webinars. So if you have a group of people that would like to find out more about these types of plans, give us a call. I'll uh, be more than happy to engage with you. And uh, also, um, our, our programs can be used for continuing education credits for certain designations, and some of them are notable, like the Certified Financial Planner Board, uh, the NASB for CPAs, uh, and, and, other, and other credentials as well. And last but not least, we do hold uh, annually uh, what we call the IRA Academy. It's a preparatory course for the American Bankers Association's designation called the Certified IRA Services Professional designation. Now, why is self-directed IRA retirement accounts, unlike uh, other types of uh, uh, providers, they basically offer you the investments that they offer at that financial institution, and, and that's how they make their money. We, we work a little bit differently. A self-directed administrator does not necessarily make any money off of the investments, but instead, we make our money by offering the platform that allows for you to choose the investments that you would hold that you would like to hold under your retirement plan. In other words, you're not stuck with uh, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You can actually hold other types of investments. Um, uh, in other words, we do all the necessary IRS paperwork that's done on an annual basis. However, of course, we 
we we we require that the IRA holder uh, works with us because keep in mind those investments are not offered by the interest groups. Uh, those investments are chosen by you, the IRA holder. So we need to, for example, get the value of the investment that you um, invested in, so on and so forth. But for all intents and purposes, the IRA administration deals with the compliance requirements uh, that are associated with having an IRA. The benefits of self-direction, again, you take control over the investments that you hold in a retirement plan. Again, some people go, I didn't know you could hold a piece of real estate under a retirement plan, or I didn't know you could invest in a note that, I, that they wanted to issue to somebody for a particular percentage rate. It allows for more asset diversification. In other words, we're not saying get out of the stock market. You know, if you like mutual funds, stocks, that's great. But if you also want to diversify your portfolio by adding other types of investments, take a look at the interest group because it does, it will add diversification to your portfolio, such as precious metals, real estate, uh, while still enjoying the same tax benefits that you'd have in any type of retirement plan. Now, the focus of this course, again, is the Roth basics. What, what's the difference between a traditional and a Roth? Uh, that's a very good question that uh, a lot of people ask, because they're trying to make a decision whether or not to contribute to a traditional or I like this thing called a Roth because I, I heard so many good things about it. And that's what we're going to try to cover. Uh, traditional IRAs have been around since 1975 because of the passage of a tax law called ERISA. And I'm going to go, we just went nerdy on you for a little bit. But ERISA created this thing called a traditional IRA. This is the first IRA that was created that could be established in 1975. Number one. The, one of the benefits of a traditional IRA is that contributions could possibly be used as a tax deduction. In some cases, if the person is covered by an employer-sponsored plan already, such as your 401k, 403b, or governmental 457b, or SEP, or SEMPL, depending upon the level of income an individual has, may eliminate the deductibility of their contribution to an IRA. In other words, if they make a contribution to a traditional IRA and they make a lot of money and they're covered by an employer-sponsored plan already, uh, Congress may eliminate your eligibility to be able to use that contribution as a, an amount that can reduce your taxable income for the year. That's one of the benefits of a traditional. Another benefit of a traditional is that the earnings on the investments grow tax deferred. How would you like it if you make an investment that the interest is not taxed at the end of the year, unlike other types of investments where if a dividend or interest um, is, is earned by an investment, that's going to be taxable to you at the end of the year. If it's not taxed, that allows for the, you know, allows for the earnings to grow more rapidly. Why? Because you're not getting taxed on it. Now, it, it, that's a traditional IRA. The Roth IRA came about because of what we call the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997. Uh, a, a senator by the name of Roth, Senator Roth, said, you know, there are some people that can't get their, you know, can't use their contribution as a tax deduction. And in some cases, also at, at that point, the rule said that if an individual has reached what we call the required minimum distribution age, and that's around age 70, today it's 73, that they can no longer make a contribution to a traditional IRA. So what about people who are saving up for post-retirement years, or if they can't get a tax deduction? Well, they don't have an IRA that they can contribute to. So he created legislation, which was tacked on to what we call the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997, that said, in this particular account, you don't get a deduction. Automatically, let's, let's nip, nip that in the bud, no deduction. The benefit, however, uh, of that particular account is that the earnings still grow tax deferred. In other words, earnings are not taxed while it sits in, in this particular account called a Roth. However, the benefit is, how would you like it if the growth in your account when you distribute it, will never be taxed ever again. That is huge. Now let's broaden our horizons a little bit. Let's say somebody contributes to a Roth uh, and, and later on we'll also learn this thing called a conversion. It's not a spiritual experience, but it's taking your assets in a traditional IRA or 401k plan that's never been taxed before, paying, in the, tax, paying the tax in the year of the conversion so that as those assets are moved into your Roth account, you'll enjoy prospectively, in other words, moving forward after that conversion has taken place, the earnings will hopefully never be taxed ever again. 
if you satisfy certain criteria. Imagine buying a house under a Roth IRA and that number one, not only are you enjoying the growth on that investment, hopefully, depending upon the market, if it's a rental property, the rental income is also not going to get taxed as the Roth IRA receives it. And once you satisfy certain criteria, which we'll cover later on, how would you like it that that uh, the rental income can be distributed to you? Can, to, can be distributed, it's hard to say that, can be distributed to you, tax what? Free! In other words, there's no taxation. Another benefit of a Roth uh, is, is the fact that if, let's say you like the piece of property and you want to take it out of your Roth IRA and you've satisfied all the criteria to have it be tax-free, how would you like to be able to distribute that house tax-free? Unlike a traditional you can buy houses as well. You can buy all these other types of investments that you can buy on a Roth. It just so happens that when you take money out, it's going to get taxed. So that's one of the main differences. In a traditional IRA, you, you're allowed to grow at the same rate as a Roth because it's the same investment. It's growing tax deferred. However, when you take money out of a traditional IRA, generally it's going to get taxed. Whereas in a Roth IRA, you have the opportunity to be able to distribute everything from that Roth tax-free. Now, let's quickly take a poll. Which feature of a Roth IRA interests you the most? All right, I'm just going to wait for a few seconds while y'all are, you know, figuring out your um, answer to that. And then we'll move on with our with our presentation. All right. That allows me to get a drink of water as well. So. Thank you, JP. We'll allow for about 10 more seconds here. All right, looks like we're going to have about everyone here. Thank you. We're going to end the poll. Appreciate everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, let's move on ahead. Here we go. Characteristics of a Roth. Again, it's a, it's like a, it's like it's an individual retirement account. In other words, an individual must you know establish it. You can't have a joint uh, Roth IRA. It will be called a JRA, right? So uh, it's Roth IRA is just like a traditional. Uh, and how do you establish it? you have to complete a document. And that's one of the one, one of the services that Entrust pro provides is you we provide you the document to establish your Roth IRA, which is also, by the way, a valid trust under state law. So in other words, look at it as a trust that there's a, a certain set of rules within that trust that allows for you to avail of the, the tax benefits under the federal law that allows for you, number one, those earnings are growing tax deferred. In other words, earnings are not taxed as long as it goes back into the Roth IRA. And later on, when you take that money out, in other words, you take that money out and make it payable to yourself. In other words, you, you withdraw assets from that Roth IRA. How would you like it later on, if you satisfy certain criteria, that the assets or the earnings and the earnings are going to be tax-free? That's the benefit of the Roth. Now, how do you distribute earnings tax-free from a Roth? You have to satisfy two sets of criteria. Number one, Number one, you must have had a Roth for five years. In other words, the moment you contribute to a Roth, the clock for that five years starts for all of your Roths for the rest of your life. So if you've never had a Roth, you know what the moral of the story is? Go set up one. Because what it does is that it starts to clock for all of your Roth IRAs for the rest of your life. In other words, once you satisfy that five-year clock, well, guess what? you will not have to satisfy that five-year clock ever again. So start as early as you can, even, even though we're still learning about the Roth, right? As a matter of fact, when you make a contribution to a Roth at any time during the year, the clock starts as of January 1st of the year for which a contribution makes, uh, for, for the, the year for which the contribution was made. In other words, let me give you some examples. Let's say right now is June. Let's say it's June today and you make a contribution to your Roth for the first time, or your clock started January 1st of this year. In other words, it doesn't start when you make the contribution. It starts it as of January 1st of the year. There are also some circumstances where an individual may wait until their tax return due date to make that contribution. Well, if it's for the prior year, it actually goes back to January 1st of the year for which that contribution was made. Now, again, if you don't have a Roth, the incentive is go contribute because there's no minimum amount that you have to contribute to a Roth 
to start your clock. So you can put $10 in a Roth IRA if, if the financial institution would accept it. And that starts your clock for all of your Roths for the rest of your life. Now, the only thing that you need to be waiting for is one of the three. It's the second half of the criteria. It's either one of these particular scenarios. Either you die. You don't want that to happen. But if, but if you die, how would you like to be able to leave your uh, beneficiaries, uh, let's say your spouse or your kids, or maybe you want a name, how would you like to be able to leave it to them tax-free? Number two, if you become disabled, there are certain individuals out there that may not be healthy or they have a very risky job. In other words, a dangerous job, like a police, a cop or military or whatever it may be. If you feel like, you know, there's a chance that you could possibly become disabled or because of your health. Well, guess what? If you've had a Roth of five years and you become disabled, all your Roth IRAs uh, will be tax free, including new contributions. Here's, here's, the, here's the one that a lot of people target. The moment you reach retirement age, and some people are saying, you know, 59 and a half. It won't, the moment you reach 59 and a half, even though you don't retire, and you've had a Roth of five years, guess what? All of your Roths are tax-free for the rest of your life. That's a powerful statement right there. And then last but not least, you have some young people, as an example, let's say they contribute to a Roth. And they want to use it to purchase a primary residence, or even for you who, who may have not owned your primary residence, um, you know, two years for the, you know, prior to the purchase of one. Let's say you've never owned your primary residence, you want to buy a house. You not only can you distribute the contributions, because keep in mind there's no tax deduction on a Roth, you can also distribute up to ten thousand dollars of the earnings as long as you're going to use it for purchasing a primary residence. And that whole distribution will be, what, tax-free as long as, again, the contributions are distributed because those have been taxed already. And number two, up to 10000 of the earnings can be used for such a purpose. And, it, and if it's distributed from a Roth, it's tax-free. Now, keep in mind, in, in a self-directed world, there are such a thing as what we call a prohibited transaction. Some people ask me, can I, can I invest in my own business? Well, that's a conflict of interest. That's a type of prohibited transaction. Or somebody asked, asked me one time, well, can I buy a house, my house, under my Roth IRA and live in it? The answer is no, because that's a conflict of interest again. Congress, when they created IRAs, also included what we call prohibited transaction rules under Section 4975 of the Code. Since Roth IRAs already have a, such a great benefit, avoid engaging in those types of transactions. In other words, you cannot have a sale, exchange, leasing, performing services. In other words, it has to be an arm's length transaction. What the biggest difference, however, between a traditional and a Roth is that in a traditional IRA, while the IRA holder is alive, the moment they reach age 73, it used to be age 70 and a half, later on changed to 72, and now the recently passed a Secure Act 2.0 increased it again to 73. <clears throat> An individual who reaches that age needs to start depleting that IRA by being required to take what we call a minimum amount, a small amount to start depleting that IRA. In a Roth IRA, it is not subject to required minimum distributions when a person reaches age 73. So you know what happens when a person reaches age 73? nothing to their Roth IRA. They can continue to accumulate those assets in that Roth IRA and eventually be distributed tax-free. Now, again, the advantages of a Roth IRA, tax-free distributions after the criteria we talked about are met. In other words, you've just had a Roth of five years and one of the four, death, disability, attainment of 59 and a half, as well as if you're going to use it to purchase a primary residence, first-time home purchase, you can use up to $10,000 of the earnings tax-free. There's also no aging out. In other words, you can contribute it as long as you have what we call earned income. A lot of people uh, past their, you know, uh, that, that had reached retirement age, let's say retire from their current job, but does something else. You know, they, does something that they really wanted to do. And they, they have earned income. In other words, wages for services performed. Well, one of the benefits of that is that you can continue to make contributions to a Roth IRA and continue to build your nest egg until such time that you go, you know, I'm going to hang up everything and I'm, I don't want to work anymore. As long as you're working, you have income, you can contribute to a Roth IRA 
as long as your income does not exceed certain limits. In other words, if you're earning a lot of income, well, that, that might prohibit you from having a Roth because Congress is saying, you know, if you're rich, may not be able to do to contribute to a Roth. But there's another transaction called a conversion we're going to talk about later on that converts your, uh, you, know, you, you can still contribute to a traditional, that's an example, and you want to put that in a Roth. You can, you can do a conversion if, if you still wanted to put money in a Roth IRA. It just can't be directly contributed if you make too much money. Now, non-qualified distributions are still a, 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 a benefit for Roth. Let me explain what that means. When making a contribution to a Roth, there are, there are different types of dollars that are sitting in an individual's Roth, meaning you make contributions and then you didn't use it as a tax deduction, so therefore those dollars have been taxed already. There are some situations an individual may move money from their traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, called a conversion, which I just kind of briefly explained what that is earlier. Conversion dollars are tax, have, have been taxed already in the year of conversion. See, in other words, those dollars that hopefully are being tracked, there, there's a tracking mechanism, an IRS form that an IRA holder must file to keep track of the conversion dollars, or another term for that is what we call conversion basis, a fancy fancy term for dollars that have been taxed already. And lastly, in a Roth IRA, if a person has not satisfied the criteria, meaning it's not qualified as of yet, the earnings have not been taxed before. So in other words, there are three layers to that. The ordering rules mean that when you're taking a distribution from a Roth and the earnings are still taxable, well, you, you actually tap into your contributions first automatically. So if you have multiple contributions that you've made at multiple organizations, until you use those up, you're not going to get into the second layer. The second layer is what we call conversions. And obviously, the conversions have been taxed already, right? So it's not going to get taxed again. Then and only then, after you use up the contributions and conversions, are you going to tap into earnings. And if you haven't satisfied the qualified distribution criteria, I highly recommend do not touch the earnings because those earnings are going to get taxed and also subject to a penalty. So in other words, what's the moral of the story? If you're going to contribute to a Roth start early, and number two, don't touch it until it's qualified. Qualified means, again, you've had a Roth of five years and you have one of the four, death, disability, attainment of 59 and a half, and up to $10,000 of the earnings can be distributed for primary residence uh, purposes. Now, keep in mind, if once your Roth IRA is, is tax-free, guess who enjoys that as well? If you leave a nest egg to somebody else after your death, well, your heirs will also be able to distribute those amounts tax-free. So in other words, kind of a legacy planning type of a strategy um, for, for you if you would like to contribute to a Roth. Here are the funding sources of a Roth. How do you put money in a Roth? One are contributions. Another way to, to fund your Roth, let's say you wanted to establish a Roth IRA at the Entrust Group and you wanted to fund it because you wanted to invest in other things like real estate, mortgage uh, mortgages, notes, whatever. You can actually transfer uh, other Roth accounts that you already have at another institution, in this case, Roth IRAs, and you can actually transfer them. It's a non-reportable, non-taxable event moving from one Roth, let's say, at a mutual fund company to the interest group or at an insurance company, Roth, uh, Roth annuity in an insurance company, and you sell the annuity and or surrender the annuity, and the proceeds can be transferred to your Roth account at the interest group and start investing. You can also convert non-Roth accounts, such, such as your traditional IRA, your SEP IRA, in other words, if you had a simplified employee pension plan that you participated in, or maybe even a simple plan, a simple a savings incentive match plan that some small businesses establish. After two years, those can also be converted to a Roth IRA. Now, so in other words, there are several ways to uh, fund or put money into your Roth IRA. Number one, contributions, transfers from other Roth accounts, and conversions from non-Roth accounts. So the contribution limits for tax year 2023, why are we talking about 2024? Because we haven't gotten the numbers yet from the IRS. Typically, it comes out towards the end of the year. At this point, when we're delivering, while we're delivering this uh, uh, webinar, uh, there's no new, new new numbers for tax year 2023. It's all it's already too late for tax year 2022. That's why we don't have it on the screen. For tax year 2023, 
If an individual is under the age of 50, they can contribute up to $6,500 as long as, number one, they have enough earned income to support the contribution, and number two, they don't make too much money. If a person is age 50 or older, they have the privilege of making an additional contribution called a catch-up contribution. That catch-up contribution is $1,000. So if you're 50 and older, guess what? The maximum contribution to the Roth is $7,500. And if you have a married couple filing a joint tax return and you have enough income to support, you know, making a contribution to you and your spouse, well, depending upon how old they are, they can either make a $6,500 contribution or a $7,500 contribution if they're 50 and older. So in other words, by combining, you know, by combining that dollar figure, of course, contributed to each individual's Roth IRA, that's about, that's about 15,000 bucks of individual retirement account Roth IRA contributions you can make to your Roth IRA to kind of seed into your investing uh, journey. Now, what determines whether or not an individual is rich when it comes to a Roth? Here are the, what we call the phase-out ranges or the income limits to determine whether or not an individual can or cannot contribute to a Roth. Let's first start off with a single individual. The maximum threshold uh, of, of income an individual can receive. And by the way, the definition of this is what we call the modified adjusted gross income. So in other words, if you take a look at your large income and you adjust it by certain adjustments, and that can be found in your IRS form 1040, this income that we're looking at is what we call a reduced income. In other words, it's already been adjusted. So let's say you make 200 grand and you contribute to your 401k plan at work. The maximum contribution this year is 23,500. Well, you don't use the larger income, you reduce that by the, your adjustment. Let's say you participate in your employer's health insurance program, like a cafeteria plan. In other words, money's being taken out of your paycheck. Well, money being taken out of your paycheck will also reduce your taxable income for the year. That's a part of the process of determining whether or not your income is adjusted. Well, your modified adjusted gross income, if it does not exceed 138000 Uncle Sam says, you're not rich if you're a single filer. If you're a married couple filing a joint tax return and your modified adjusted gross income does not exceed 218,000 as a married couple filing a joint tax return, you're not rich. However, if you're a married couple filing a separate return, in other words, uh, your tax advisor says, hey, let's separate you as a couple and when filing a return, file you folks as single individuals. Well, the reason why they say that is because it may yield a lower tax liability already. And Uncle Sam says you can't have your cake and eat it too. So therefore, the phase-out range to determine whether or not you can make a Roth contribution is a lot lower, and that's zero to 10,000. But as you can see, these are large thresholds for single individuals and married couples filing a joint tax return to determine whether or not they can contribute to a Roth IRA. And again, the definition is the modified adjusted, that's the key term, adjusted gross income. If your income is less than that, well, guess what? You can make a contribution to your Roth, you know, and, and hopefully you're patient enough to enjoy what we call tax-free distribution of earnings. One other thing you might, might, might not brush over or might not think about, I'm going to bring it up. Some of y'all have family members or kids, right? And some of your kids may have earned income. They have a part-time job, or you can employ them as a, you know, as a business owner, whatever it may be, they, if they have earned income, well, that qualifies them to make a Roth contribution. Now, if they're a minor, there are some stipulations that uh, you might want to be aware of, such as they may not be able to sign a Roth document for themselves. So you may involve you as a parent to sign on their behalf. As long as they have earned income, they can, and, and they don't exceed these income limits, well, guess what? They can, they can contribute to a Roth. And the contribution does not have to come from them. It could come from you as the parent. What does that do for them? Well, it seeds money into the Roth IRA so that later on, let's say they wanted to buy a house. Well, not only can they take the contributions that have been made to that Roth, they can also take up to $10,000 to buy their first home. Or, um, you know, they wanted to take the money out, the, the contribution amounts, because those can be distributed at any time to fund their education. So in other words, there are other purposes that um, an individual could use their Roth retirement savings, not just for retirement, but it can be used for other types of, of situations. Now, another funding, funding vehicle we talked about was transferring between like IRAs. In other words, Roth to Roth. 
If you had a Roth at a mutual fund company, again, it can be transferred to your Roth at Antrust Group. In other words, it's a non-taxable, non-reportable movement of retirement assets between the same types of plans, Roth to Roth, Roth to Roth. Um, with, with uh, you know, um, again, with a transfer, it's non-reportable as well as it's non-taxable. Now, another way to move uh, money into a Roth IRA is taking your traditional IRAs, which, you know, your SEP IRA is also a traditional IRA, or your simple IRA that has satisfied what we call a two-year rule. You can actually take a distribution from that and move it to your Roth. And by the way, when you do a conversion, regardless of how old you are, there is no 10% early distribution penalty. So the earlier you do it, the more chance you'll be able to have those those earnings on your investments grow tax deferred. And it, it'll, it might, I, I don't know about you, I'd rather for my earnings to grow on my Roth than a traditional because eventually the earnings in your Roth will be distributed tax what? Free. In other words, there's no taxation. You've eliminated taxation by moving your assets from a traditional to a Roth in the year of conversion. However, be prepared. You're going to have to pay taxes on that amount. Let's be honest. Uncle Sam's not going to let you go from a traditional IRA to a Roth without paying the tax on it. But again, there is no 10% early distribution penalty when you convert. All right. Now let's quickly take another poll. Andrew, I'm going to read the question. A blank is the process of moving funds from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. We just covered that. So let's take a poll and see if, if uh, people remember what we talked about. Great. Thank you, JP. We'll leave this open here for about 30 seconds, about 15 seconds in. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating. JP, all you. Sounds good. Now, um, my slide's not moving here in a second. There you go. What, what type of investments can you invest uh, with the contributions that you made to a Roth or transfers or conversions to a Roth? Well, just anything you can contribute to a traditional or anything you can invest with, with your traditional IRA, you can invest with a Roth IRA. Um, th there are just some stipulations on what you want to avoid when making investments in all types of retirement plans, such as your, 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 your prohibited transaction rules that I mentioned earlier. But almost anything can be invested in under an IRA. There are two significant types of investments that you cannot have under a retirement plan. It's a lot easier to talk about what you can have than what you can have. All right. There's two. I'm going to add a third one to that later on. But, but what can you invest in? Real estate, private equity. You can do private lending. You can invest in precious metals, gold, silver, palladium. With a shaky, uh, with a shaky uh, situation right now, we have in banking. Some people go, "What's the value of the dollar going to be when if, if things collapse or crash?" Well, some people are investing in precious metals. Now, we don't advocate just picking one of these, but we advocate picking a whole bunch of them to leverage uh, your investments and 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 mitigate risk, right? Uh, cryptocurrency and much more. You know, real estate is still probably one of my favorites and uh, one of the favorites of a lot of our clients. Why? Because real estate doesn't go anywhere. So even if it fluctuates, you're still collecting rent, right? So some people go, well, I don't have enough money to do that. Well, there are many ways to be able to buy real estate, such as you can partner with other people if you don't have enough cash. You can also take what we call a non-recourse loan. Not you, by the way, but the IRA can actually take a loan. I don't know if you know this, your IRA can actually borrow money but it just has to be what we call a non-recourse loan. In other words, you can't use your own credit to qualify for that loan. The underwriting guidelines for those particular types of loans is a little bit different than your regular loan. And the interest group actually has a list of what we call those non-recourse loan lenders, if you ever wanted to dive into that, right? Uh, there are additional tax reporting requirements uh, when you do borrow money to purchase an investment under a retirement plan, but that's where your CPA comes in and they can assist you in completing those particular forms. But as you can see, there's a broad array of investments that you can invest in in the self-directed world. Now, keep in mind, in a self-directed world, you can still invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Funds, But the self-directed world really specializes in what other people don't want to hold. In other words, if you go to Schwab or TD Ameritrade, they may say, you know, you, you can't do real estate under our IRA over here. Rightfully so, because they're a broker-dealer. They handle the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You may have to go to a self-directed administrator as an example, saying that's what the interest group is, right? 
Investment restrictions. Here are, here are the types of investments you cannot have under law. Number one, life insurance contracts. Somebody would somebody said, well, can I, can I insure myself under my IRA that if I die, the proceeds of my life insurance will go into my IRA? Sounds like a good racket, but you can't. You can't, you can't have a life insurance contract that, that insures you, the IRA holder. All right. Number two, you also cannot have collectibles. Some people wanted to put uh, precious gems in the IRA world when it first started. When some of them were able to because this rule wasn't there. And what they found is that a lot of institutions don't know how to value precious gems. So in other words, that's one of the motivations, the reasons why you can't have collectibles under a retirement plan, because for administrative purposes, it's not practical. But the Small Business Job Protection Act of 1996 did expand it a little bit to allow for those precious metals that I mentioned earlier in the previous slide. You can have American Eagle coins, silver and palladium. You can't have all precious metals, but uh, what I'm talking about right now are what, are what you can have. And if it's a bullion, meaning that it can be another foreign country's uh, currency like gold, but it has to meet a certain level of fineness. In other words, it, it, it can't be it, it can't be under par to what Congress specifies as the level of fineness for that precious metal uh, to be held under a retirement plan. Well, if if you have any uh, interest in precious metals, we do have a precious metals portal. So uh, feel free to browse around that or call our 800 number and ask our people to say, how, how do I get into that precious metal portal? Hey, I'd be more than happy to direct you to it because you still have to make a decision on what you want to hold on your retirement plan. It's just a platform that offers you access to it. And then last but not least, S corporations. Let's say you had a friend that had an S corporation and said, hey, I, I'm looking for investors. Generally, an IRA can invest in somebody else's company, especially if you think that the company is going to do well, right? Uh, S corporations, however, on the other hand, um, which was clarified under a revenue ruling, and I'm going to go nerdy on you again, it's revenue ruling 92-73, as well as the tax court case, Taproot versus the commissioner. Well, the, the, the tax court says um, an IRA, which by the way, I mentioned earlier, an IRA is what we call a trust. As a matter of fact, it's what we call a grantor trust. Grantor trusts cannot be a shareholder of an S corp. So you can invest in some other people's companies, but if it's an S corp, that is something that you might want to know in the back of your mind that you cannot invest in using your retirement plan assets, right? And now let's take a look at what is a prohibited transaction. According to the IRS publication 590, it's any improper use of your IRA by you, your beneficiary, or any disqualified person. In other words, it's trying to prevent what we call um, self-dealing. In other words, let's say you let's say you wanted to invest in your own company and you're getting paid for your company and you're, you're also growing your own company uh, under your retirement plan. That's self-dealing. That that's a type, those are the types of transactions that Congress didn't want people to do under their retirement plan uh, to avoid, of course, of course, abuse. But you can invite you you can invest in somebody else's company. And that's why in most 401k plans or IRAs, they invest in stocks like IBM or, you know, some of the more notable ones, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, whatever it may be, if you if you have over 300 grand per share, of course, <laughs> you can invest in other people's companies. Prohibited transactions can also be direct or indirect. The transaction that you may have should not be in the spirit of the law, should not be, <laughs> should not be something that you're doing to avoid taxation. In other words, that's called tax evasion. In other words, if, 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 if you facilitate a transaction because you want to circumvent the law, that could be what we call an indirect prohibited transaction. Acceptable transactions, however, are partnering with yourself on a new deal. In other words, you're buying somebody else's house with your IRA and your own money or partnering with your cousin. And I haven't covered this. The reason why a cousin is not uh, engaging with a cousin is not prohibited because uh, the, the prohibited transaction rules uh, when it comes to family members, only applies to lineal ascendants and lineal descendants. Lineal ascendants means your grandparents, your great-grandparents, or your children, your grandchildren, and the spouses thereof. What if it was your cousin? Your cousin is not a lineal descendant. So therefore, you can partner with your cousin. You can partner with other family members, like your uncle, in order for you to, to accumulate enough cash in, you know, to be able to close the deal and their assets does not have to be in a retirement plan, but it's just that the incomes and the, and the expenses must be paid back proportionately. So if there's an expense, 
Some has to come from your uncle and some has to come from your IRA. And if there's income coming in like rental income, it also has to be split proportionately based on the percentages to your uncle and your IRA, in my example. You can also partner with your spouse on a new deal. But after that, um, permanent transaction rules will kick in. Why? Because if you're 50-50, there are rules in regards to uh, engaging with entities that your IRA owns at least 50% of or you own 50% of. If you're 50-50 with your spouse, that kind of gets into that realm already. So check with your tax advisor or legal advisor before entering into any, any type of transaction because the repercussions of engaging in a prohibited transaction is quite dire. Me meaning the moment an IRA holder engages in a prohibited transaction, in an IRA that has an asset in it that you know engage in a prohibited transaction, that whole IRA ceases to be an IRA and becomes fully taxable, right? Or leasing leasing a property to your siblings because siblings are not uh, uh, they're not uh, disqualified persons. I, I think you get the point. If you're going to do uh, prohibited transactions, uh, or, or if if you're going to do IRAs, avoid prohibited transactions. Here again is another slide that talks about disqualified persons. Yourself, you know, your spouse, your lineal descendants, and their spouses, your lineal ascendants, the beneficiary of your IRA, maybe your sister, right, or brother. A corporation or partnership or a state that you or any disqualified person has at least a 50% stake in. Somebody wanted to loan money to a company and later on finds out that his son-in-law owned 50% of that company or was an officer, right? So in other words, the permanent transaction rules is something that need to be avoided in order for you to, to enjoy the benefits that you've worked hard for in, in your retirement plan, especially a Roth. Uh, and if you're not clear, talk to your tax or legal advisor and have them walk you through that process. And the interest group can give general piece of information, but if it, if it goes deeper, that's something that we we cannot do since we're not uh, an institution that, that offers tax advice or legal advice. That's when your CPA or your attorney comes in. Now, when it comes to Roth IRA, how does the IRS know what happens in an IRA? Well, an IRA generally is, you know, what happens in an IRA stays in an IRA. It's like Vegas, right? However, if money comes in and money comes out, that's reported to the IRS. Reporting uh, Roth distributions are reported on what we call an IRS Form 1099-R. So that's how the IRS knows that is it still taxable or non-taxable. Hopefully the custodian has enough information the custodian, meaning the person, the ent entity that's holding your IRA has enough information to determine whether or not your distribution is taxable or not. However, if they cannot decipher that, meaning it's a non-qualified distribution, you, the taxpayer, needs to keep track a lot of your of, of your contributions that have been made. And that's done in what we call an IRS Form 5498. So if you have a Roth IRA and you receive an IRS Form 5498, and I'm going to get specific in here, Box 10 reports all your contributions. Keep track of all your 5498s because you're going to need that if you decide to take a distribution prematurely before uh, being eligible for a qualified distribution. There's also what we call the IRS Form 8606 that's walks, that walks you through the process of determining whether or not a distribution is taxable or not. Because keep in mind, contributions come out first on a Roth and then a conversions and then earnings. Don't pay any more tax than you need to. And that's why this, that's why the Form 8606 walks you through walks you through that. And that form is from the IRS. Again, for qualified distribution purposes, here's another good illustration. Qualified meaning earnings are tax-free at this point, meaning you've had a Roth for five years. Again, what's the moral of the story? If you don't have a Roth, go get one. At least it starts your five-year clock. Even start the five-year clock for your kids. If they decide to contribute to a Roth, at least it's, they started their five-year clock uh, for, for, for themselves, right? And as well as you must satisfy one of the four qualifying events, death, disability, turning 59 and a half, yay, you, you've gotten to that, that uh, age wherein you can actually take tax-free distributions from your Roth as long as you've had a Roth for five years. And last but not least, for younger folks, that you know, 59 and a half is pretty far away, but they've had a Roth for five years. They can use up to $10,000 of the earnings on that Roth. For first-time home buyer purposes, and that and and up to ten thousand dollars of the earnings will be tax what free. In other words, you don't have to pay taxes on it if it's used for that purpose. Additional tax reporting. I'm gonna go a little technical on you. There are some individuals that may want to invest in a business, right? In other words, that a restaurant. It's an example. I had a friend that wanted to invest 
in another friend's trailer company because yeah, you know, they're 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 going to be making this particular special trailer that that a lot of people are wanting to buy. So in other words, he he saw some growth in that company. That income is what we call trade or business income. If you invest in a uh, in an asset or an investment that has trade or business income, whether it be an IRA, whether it be a, a traditional IRA, Roth IRA, SEP or simple IRA, it, that income may be taxable because if the income exceeds a thousand dollars, and by the way, it's gross income, it's not net income, the gross income, you, you still may not have to pay taxes because you, you have deductions on, on that income. The IRS just wants to see how much did you take in and what are what are the expenses. And and um, you know, if if the gross income is a thousand dollars or more, that IRA would have to file a tax return. And the tax return for an IRA, since it's what we call an exempt organization, is the IRS Form 990T. So uh, the IRA will need to acquire its own EIN. It's fairly simple to acquire an EIN. I've done it many, many times. And uh, it's in a matter of minutes, you can get your own EIN. And then file the 990T with that income. And at, at that point, depending upon the level of income, it may be taxable. However, keep in mind, you're still you're growing your, your IRA using uh, investments such as businesses. That tax is what we call unrelated business income tax, or UBTI, right? Additional tax reporting. As I mentioned before, let's say you, your IRA decides to borrow money to purchase a piece of real estate, right? In an IRA, uh, Uncle Sam says, although rental income is generally not taxable, however, if you bor borrowed a portion to purchase that property, that portion or that percentage that, that you borrowed will be applied to the income received by that IRA and that amount is gonna be taxable to the IRA. That's also considered unrelated business taxable income, but, but that portion or that income that's taxable is what we call unrelated debt financed income. Keep in mind, it's been around for a long time. That's why the IRS has forms on it. But imagine, imagine buying a piece of property using somebody else's money so that you can grow your wealth under that retirement plan because rental income is actually paying for that loan. What a great strategy to grow your wealth in your retirement plan. Now, keep in mind, um, you know, uh, when, when, when you have uh, uh, unrelated debt finance income, make sure it's, a, it's an income producing property because a lot of the lenders won't lend to you unless they know that the IRA can actually pay them back, all right? The um, and of course every month, depending upon the type of loan that you get, the 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 income from that IRA is paying back that loan. And eventually, if that loan once that loan gets paid off, well, you just basically paid uh, paid for that particular piece of real estate, not not using your own money. the The term for that is what we call unrelated debt financed income. The, the income that is received by that IRA is subject to tax tax rates. And in this case, if, since it's an, an, an IRA is a trust, it's taxed at trust tax rates, all right? <clears throat> Other investments, however, <clears throat> not subject to UBTI or UBIT, if you want to hold it in your Roth or your you know, uh, stocks, dividends, rental property, rights. Uh, as a matter of fact, gains or not, let's say you bought a house at 200,000 10 years from now, you sold it at a half a million. That difference generally is taxable, not taxable under an IRA. It's called capital gains. There's no capital gains taxation in a retirement plan. And if it's a Roth and you've had a Roth of five years and you turn 59 and a half as an example, how would you like all that to be distributed tax what? Tax free, right? So in other words, there, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunities to be able to grow your wealth. Oh, here's an example of a of a of a property. And uh, let's say you bought the house 50 50, 50 percent using your IRA and 50 percent using a non recourse loan. And let's say the monthly income of that um, piece of property is two thousand. In other words, twenty four thousand dollars for the year. Well, twelve thousand of that simplistically will be taxable because that was the percentage that was used. To borrow to that was borrowed to purchase that property, meaning that twelve thousand of the twenty four thousand will be taxable to that IRA um, for the year, since fifty percent of the um, of the amount used to purchase that property was from a non recourse loan lender. Now keep in mind that was just a simplistic 
uh, example, because every month that that IRA pays back that loan, that IRA owns more and more and more of that investment. And that's therefore eventually once that uh, property is paid off using uh, the rental income from the renters of, of that property, well, then your IRA eventually may own 100% of that investment and you grew your wealth with, without using your own money, you're using other people's money. All right. This is what the IRS Form 990T looks like. And this is where your tax advisor again comes in, right? Your, your tax advisor should know how to complete this thing called an IRS Form 990T, right? Now let's test what we've learned. Um, Andrew, let's, let's take another poll. True or false? <clears throat> True or false? Roth IRA investment earnings are always distributed tax-free. Thank you, JP. Poll launched. We'll give this about 30 seconds like the others. About 10 more seconds here. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating. JP, you want to send us home? All right. I'll send you home. Let's, let's answer this question. Are, are Roth... Are Roth earnings always distributed tax-free? The answer is no. You must satisfy the qualified distribution criteria. In other words, you must have had a Roth for five years and one of the four, death, disability, 59 and a half, and up to $10,000 of the earnings can be used for first-time home purchase. But without satisfying that criteria, the earnings in a Roth are going to be taxed. So what's the moral story? Number one, set up a Roth if you don't already have one. And number two, have the patience to be able to get to that place that your distributions from your Roth are tax-free. All right. Well, what's next? We have upcoming webinars at the Entrust Group. And I think the next one is IRA LLCs. Um, there's stuff floating right out there. Checkbook control. Is that right for you? It's nice to be able to discuss the details about that and where it came from, how, you know, how, how it kind of works. And, and so you can make a decision whether or not it's right for you. Um, or if you want to learn something new, please let us know if there's any topics that you want to uh, discuss on a webinar. Uh, if you want to learn more about the information that we talked about, we do have a wonderful learning center. Uh, and our learning center has a lot of articles and even some presentations that uh, you might want to listen to in the event that you wanted to dive into a particular type of investment. And again, follow us on social media for any updates, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, we, we are, we, we have presence there. Engage with us. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to uh, do business with you. Now let's, it's time for questions. Let's open up the phones for any questions you may have in regards to the material presented. We're, we're approaching the top of the hour, right? Let's, let's open up the phone lines to see if there are any, any questions. Andrew, why don't you help me out here and, and kind of, you know, if there mm -hmm. are any questions and, and could you just read it and then mm -hmm. I'll, uh, yeah. Absolutely. So we got eight right now. And everyone, please go ahead as we get going here. Please type your questions in. We'll answer them in the order that they are entered. All right. Question number one. JP, if you could please explain the best way and when to convert money from rollover IRA to Roth IRA. Okay. The best way to convert a rollover, a rollover IRA meaning, and let me let me explain that to the folks that are listening. A rollover IRA means somebody um, rolled over from a 401k plan, 403b or governmental 457b to a traditional IRA. Some organizations call it a rollover IRA because uh, they're trying to keep those assets separate because it came from a previous employer's plan. What's the best way to convert that? Just contact your uh, IRA provider and say, I'd like to convert these assets, whatever amount that would be to your Roth IRA. But keep in mind, when you're going to convert this is just a recommendation. Check the investments that are under that rollover IRA to see if it has fluctuated in value. The reason for that is you, you don't want to sell investments at a loss, right? And this is where your this is where your investment advisor would come into play. You can convert incrementally. You don't have to convert the whole thing. So you can invert convert the ones that may have um, gone back to its previous value or exceeded that value. In other words, you're you're selling that investment as a gain because by by realizing your loss when you convert in other words an asset that has fluctuated in value well you can't get that money back right so check with you and work with your tax advisor on which investments are best suited to convert 
But to do the conversion, just talk to your IRA provider and tell them I'd like to convert a portion of my, you know, traditional SEP or simple or rollover IRA in this case to a Roth IRA, and they, they can walk you through that process. But remember, it is taxable, although it's not subject to the 10% early distribution penalty. It is taxable. Be prepared to pay the tax. Now, some people say, well, can I just withhold the money from or, or set aside a portion of that distribution and send it to Uncle Sam uh, directly? And the answer is it's not advisable if you're under age 59 and a half. The reason for that is this. When I mentioned that when you convert dollars from a traditional SEP or simple to a Roth IRA, it's not subject to the 10% penalty, early distribution penalty. But keep in mind, that's only for dollars that actually hit the Roth, because those are the money dollars that you convert. If you have an amount withheld, in other words, set aside, but that goes directly to Uncle Sam, in other words, the government. If that amount never hit your Roth, that amount, if you're under age 59 and a half, will not only be subject to a tax, but it'll also be subject to a penalty. So if you're going to convert, make sure that you can afford the tax liability for that conversion. That's why not, this is where you work with your CPA or your tax advisor to say, if I took money out, I know it's going to be taxable. How is that, how is that going to affect my tax liability for the year? And then you can create a strategy on how much you can convert. You can convert incrementally. Some people incre have a strategy like in 10 years, I would have converted all my pre-tax to a Roth. Well, if that works for them, they've created a strategy. Likewise with you. Work with your tax advisor in regards to how much can I convert every year so that I can count on a certain dollar figure that I would have to pay and not any more than that. You're, you're the only one that will know how much you can afford to pay taxes on. So, so work with that and determine how much you, you know, you, you'd like to convert, right? Thank you, JP. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, go ahead. Great. So I know you covered this a bit, but just to recap for them, um, when it comes to the rollover to Roths, when does that five-year clock exactly start for each rollover? Okay. When, when an individual does a rollover to a Roth, in other words, like a conversion, it's basically what we call a conversion. Uh, number one, there are two five-year clocks that we're talking about. One five-year clock are, are for distribution of earnings tax-free. And that starts for any amount that hits the Roth as an eligible contribution or a conversion. So if you do a conversion and it, it was illegal, well, guess what? That starts the clock for all of your Roths for the rest of your life. Another five-year clock uh, that you need to pay close attention to is when you do a conversion. A conversion has a separate five-year clock, not for tax purposes, but for penalty purposes. Let's say you're under 59 and a half. Let's say you're 37 years old, way under 59 and a half. It may be exaggerated, but it's just for example purposes. You're 37 years old and you did a conversion, all right? Well, if we take a, dist if we take a distribution of the amounts that have been converted, which are sitting in your Roth, you won't be taxed on it. However, if it's within five years, you could be subject to a penalty. All right, I'm going to pause there for a second. Converted amounts have been taxed already, but if it's distributed within five years, it could be subject to a penalty, right? So what's the moral of the story? If you're going to convert, well, guess what? Wait five years so that if you do touch your conversion dollars, it's not going to be taxed nor penalized. Now, the five-year clock starts as of January 1st every time of the year for which a contribution is made or for which a conversion is made. So if you did a conversion in July, guess what? Your five-year clock always starts as of January 1st of that year. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, JP. No, yeah, that questions, seems, are, uh, questions are increasing. So let's, let's, <laughs> let's try to answer as many questions as we can. All right. Of course, of course. Next question. Can I make contributions for a year that I do not have any income just for that single year? Well, let's qualify what, what does it mean by not having any income. If you're married um, and you're filing a joint tax return, you can actually use your spouse's income to make your contribution as long as you're a married couple filing a joint tax return. Now, however, if you're single and you really don't have any income, unfortunately, you must have income, earned income to contribute to any type of retirement plans. In other words, you must have wages for services performed. A good example of that, the IRS calls it a safe harbor income, is your W-2. If you get a W-2 wage 
or let's say you are a self-employed individual. As long as your income is positive, you have earned income. In other words, again, to answer your question, you, you have to have earned income to make a contribution. Okay. There's another question, right, um, Andrew? Mm -hmm. In conjunction to that. Okay, go ahead. Ask that question. Yeah, so it says, can I make contributions for a year which I only have interests and capital gains? No paycheck. And ah, please correct me question. if you answered that. Yeah, well, I haven't answered that one. Interest and capital gains, all right? Interest and capital gains are what we call passive income. Unfortunately, uh, you cannot use interest and capital gains or rental income or royalties to make a contribution because those are what we call passive income. Passive income is not subject to social security tax. And that's why a lot of rich people like interest and capital gains, rental income, because it's not subject to social security tax. Uncle Sam says, if the income that you have is not participating in the social security program, meaning it's not earned income, you can't use that for contribution purposes, All right? All right, next question. All right, thank you, JP. Next question. Can I make contributions in my retirement? So kind of bouncing off what we were talking about, but just sure. to answer that directly. <laughs> sure, uh, that's a good question. Can I make contributions? I'm assuming you're, you, you mean, can I make contributions during my retirement? Well, some people during retirement are getting part-time jobs. In other words, if you have a part-time job, you have earned income. Well, you can just work up into um, up into the amount that you want to make as a contribution to your Roth IRA, and now you have earned income, yes, you can contribute that earned income amount that you have to your IRA. So in other words, you can you contribute to retirement plans during retirement? Sure, as long as you have earned income. Again, some people start businesses during retirement or even get a part-time job or do a consulting job. Those are, those are declarable earned income, and as long as it's positive, in other words, you're not taking a loss then those amounts could be used for contribution purposes. All right, next question. Thank you. Cool, so they say, you stated that S-Corp cannot be used inside of Roth. Does that apply to LLCs as well? Uh, LLCs, um, let, me, let me clarify that a little bit. LLCs are limited liability companies. Some of them are what we call single member LLCs with just one person in it. And if it's, a, and if it's two people, they consider it a partnership. There are certain situations where an individual could declare to the IRS that this LLC is being taxed as an S corporation. If it's taxed as an S corporation, that would then that would nullify, uh, even though it's an LLC, if they declared that they're an S corp, well, then the 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 Roth IRA, traditional IRA for the matter, cannot invest in that S corporation. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Thank you, JP. Regarding conversions, are there any issues involved in converting an interest in an alternative asset, such as an LLC interest? Uh, yes, the question is, that, let's say an IRA invests in an LLC and you want to convert that from a traditional to a Roth, are there any issues? Well, the only issue is they need to be able to evaluate what that LLC interest uh, value is. And in some cases, it's very difficult to to acquire. There are valuation services that could assist in calculating that uh, the value of that LLC interest. But if you do have a, a value for that LLC interest from, let's say, the general manager of the LLC, well, that amount is going to be reported as the amount that's taxable in the event of a conversion. So that's basically the main issue. And uh, per, from a personal perspective, if for you personally, uh, can you pay the, the, the tax on that conversion, that's another issue, right? So based on the amount that, that needs to be reported on an IRS form 1099-R, which again is the value of the LLC interest, can you afford to pay the tax on it, right? So there, because there is taxation on the conversion, right? Okay, another question. Thank you very much. So kind of bouncing off that, the part B from the same person was, how would the interest in an LLC be converted or rather, how would that be valued in the conversion? And can you use a valuation provided by the sponsor? Yeah, you can use the valuation provided by the sponsor because generally that's where the, the value of the LLC interest should be coming from. But you need to provide that to your custodian so that at least they have documentation on how that value was acquired, right? Thank you, JP. 
Yeah. Next question, just what is MAGI or, you know, the uh, adjusted gross income options with salary? Well, the, the, the modified adjusted gross income based on salary, let me give you an illustration I think it best describes it. Let's say your employer says that you're going to make $150,000 a year. Well, you don't get taxed on $150,000 in your IRS Form 1040. There are different schedules that are attached that could adjust that salary to determine the amount that's taxable for you for the year. I kind of gave some examples. Uh, when you receive a W-2 uh, at the end of the year from your employer where you're earning a salary and you contributed, let's say, to an, a, a 401k plan, well, guess what? Your your salary for the year, even though an, uh, an employer says, I'm going to pay you a certain dollar figure, it's going to be much less because that amount that you deferred into your 401k plan will reduce your taxable income for the year. Another thing that will uh, uh, adjust that income are is your cafeteria plan contributions for health insurance purposes or your flex plan purposes, or maybe in even an HSA contribution that is being done through a cafeteria plan for your employer. Those types of items are used as a, an adjustment to your income. So in, in the bottom of your IRS form 1040, schedule one of your 1040 generally says this is your adjusted gross income. That's a, a part of what we considered your a modified adjusted gross income. It just means that it's your adjusted gross income and certain items are added back, such as tuition interest that you use as a tax deduction. You have to add that back. So it modifies your adjusted gross income. Foreign earned income housing exclusion. There is a list of items that need to be added back to your adjusted gross income to determine your modified adjusted gross income. So if you have a salary, it's very easy to calculate your modified adjusted gross income. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the back of the IRS Form 1040, as well as Publication 560, has a worksheet that you can go through to determine your modified adjusted gross income. I hope that helps. Thank you, JP. Um, this one is a little bit off of Roths, but let me know if you have any thoughts on this or if we should need to defer sure. during a BDM. It says... What is the process to add an investment to the list that Entrust has available for current SDIRA account holders? I am interested in a venture fund investment in general. Well, if you're interested in any type of fund, we uh, the Entrust Group does not dictate what investments you can have under a retirement plan. So if you found an investment that you wanted to invest in using your self-directed IRA, all you have to do is instruct us to invest in that particular investment. Of course, you, it's your responsibility to do your du due diligence on number one, the feasibility of that investment and the credibility of that investment. And number two, that as long as you're not engaging with a disqualified party and not engaging what we call a prohibited transaction, that's really your choice. So the interest group does not dictate uh, what you can hold under your retirement plan, but we do put the, put the responsibility back to the IRA holder to make sure that they're not engaging in a prohibited transaction and that there are no guarantees on an investment. So if, if it's an investment that you want to invest in, all you would have to do is give instructions to the interest group that you'd like to purchase this investment. The form that is used to do that is what we call a buy direction letter. What you know, I'm buying something and giving is direction to be able to do that. So there, there are no, you know, there are no restrictions for that it's imposed by the interest group. What what's imposed is is law and regulations, right? Thank you, JP. Next question. If I want to purchase real estate with my SDIRA, can I still use a conventional loan and put down 20% of my IRA? That's a good question. A lot of people ask that question. I'd like to take, and take my 20% uh, uh, down payment from my IRA and I'd like to get a conventional loan. The answer is that gets a little tricky because keep in mind to get the loan, right? You're using your own credit to be able to, to acquire that loan. And when I say credit, you know, you're gonna run your FICO score, you're gonna to have to be able to prove that you can pay that the loan, but keep in mind, you cannot extend your own credit when you're purchasing a piece of property and 20% of that property is owned by your IRA. So to keep it clean, to avoid prohibited transaction rules, because keep in mind, again, we don't determine prohibited transactions, we're just providing education so that you don't, don't run afoul, you would need to have a non-recourse loan. All right, so that's highly recommended. Do a non-recourse loan, and I, I wouldn't do the twenty percent from your from your IRA. 
and then um, and then did get a conventional loan. However, we do offer what we call a solo 401k plan or an individual 401k plan, wherein you can actually take a loan from your 401k plan and use that loan as a down payment for your residence that you're that you want to uh, you know to purchase a loan on a 401k plan is different than using your assets in an IRA a loan meaning you have to repay that back right so that can be done through your 401k plan instead of an IRA so that's something you might want to explore with your CPA if that's something that uh, you wanted to dive into but that goes beyond the the, the the this course but again it's what we call an individual 401k plan and your IRA can roll over into that individual 401k plan that can acquire what we call a loan, All right? Thank you, JP. So I think you covered this, but just confirm if you did. Uh, it's asking me again, can I, can I contribute to my Roth from my savings account if I'm not working? I have no earnings for the year, but I do have money to invest for my savings. So a common situation. Yeah, and unfortunately, unless you have earned income, you cannot make a contribution to any retirement plan. So. Uh, the, the the answer to your question is no. However, if, if you wanted to contribute, then then you know um, produce some earned income. You know, for you to be able to mm -hmm. doesn't have to be much, especially if you're you're trying to just contribute seventy five hundred. Some people are going working part time or going back to consulting from their previous job, something that would generate wages for services performed. But passive income cannot be used to make a contribution. All right. Thank you, JP. Cool. Another next question. Assuming you start your Roth with adjusted income below the max 218K and your income exceeds that amount in year two, can you still contribute to the Roth? The, the modified adjusted gross income is it looked at on a year to year basis. So you may be eligible to contribute one year and that's yours. You, you, that, that doesn't nullify you having a Roth, right? It just so happens in the next year, if you have more income that year well you may not be able to contribute to that year however the following year let's say your income goes back down again well then you can contribute to your Roth for that year so it's really done on a year-to-year -year basis right so if you can you're eligible for one year hey make the contribution to the Roth and voila it starts your clock I hope that answered your question mm -hmm. thank you JP next would backdoor Roth be an option for people that exceed the income limit Yes. Um, let me explain what a backdoor Roth is. And and some people even call it a mega backdoor. I mean, everybody's trying to come up with their marketing term. A backdoor Roth means for people who make too much money to contribute to a Roth, um, work around that by making a contribution to a traditional IRA, and then they convert that to a Roth. In other words, they go the roundabout way to contribute uh, to a traditional IRA and then convert that to a Roth. Now, keep in mind, based on tax, for, for tax purposes, if you make a non-deductible contribution to an IRA, it doesn't mean that that conversion is not going to have any tax with it. The reason for that is that when you're doing a conversion and a distribution, you don't just look at that one contribution to determine taxation. There's what we call the basis recovery rules that are that's applicable since 1987, that when you're taking a look at the taxation of a distribution from an IRA, you can't just look at that one contribution. You have to put in consideration all contributions and balances in all of your IRAs, your traditional, your SEPs, and your SIMPLES to determine the taxability of that conversion. But to answer your question, can you do a backdoor to circumvent the, the, the contribution income limits for a Roth? The answer is absolutely. It's done all the time. Correct. Thank you, JP. Next. Is the conversion rate tax? Sorry, is the conversion tax rate based on annual income? Yes, uh, the if you do a conversion, that amount is just included in your taxable income for the year. So, in other words, if you're tickering from one uh, marginal tax rate to the next, you may be paying a higher tax rate on the amount that you've converted because now it's tacked on to your regular income, and voila, you're going to be paying a little bit more tax. However, if you strategize it enough with your tax advisor, work together as a team to say, you know what, I'd like to do a conversion, but I don't want to convert any more than would push me over to the next um, marginal tax rate. Well, then that that's how you strategize converting incrementally every year until all your assets are that are pre-tax are converted to your Roth. So, so that's that's definitely possible. But but to answer your question, 
conversions are included or added to your taxable income for the year. So just check what, what marginal tax rate that would fall and to see if that's something you still can afford to pay from, from a tax perspective. Right. And, and I tell people there's always next year, right? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, they say, filed an extension for 2022, not to file a return yet. I made a contribution to my traditional IRA for 2022. Can I still open a Roth starting Jan 2022? I'm not sure if they mean 2023, as we're in 2023, but no, it's, it's think January 2022. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what what I, I think your question is: I made a contribution to my traditional IRA. I filed. I have not filed my tax return yet. Mm -hmm. Can I move that amount from my traditional IRA to a Roth? That transaction is what we call a recharacterization. In in other words you know what, I like this Roth IRA, I just attended JP's class, but I made my contribution to my traditional IRA. Well, Uncle Sam says, as long as you haven't filed your tax return, in other words, your tax return, including extensions, you can still change your mind that you can, you can move that traditional IRA to a brand new Roth IRA because it was for 2022 and still count that for 2022. But what you're doing is what we call a recharacterization. Uncle Sam says, if, if you don't like that traditional IRA and you haven't filed your taxes, then move it to your Roth. But when you move the traditional IRA to the Roth, you have to include the earnings when you move that traditional IRA to the Roth. There's no taxation on it because you're just pay, basically playing musical chairs with a recharacterization as long, again, as you have not filed your tax return. But the moment you file your tax return and you pass your extension deadline, there's no more musical chairs. Wherever you end up at, is where you're going to end up. So to answer your question, that you haven't filed your tax return, yeah, you, you can recharacterize your traditional IRA and move that to a Roth, right? For, two, for, for tax year 2022, by the way. All right. Great. I hope that Thank answers you so your much. question. Yeah. Great clarity. Next, can property be partially converted from an SD IRA ownership to a partially owned Roth IRA ownership, both IRAs then owning the property and tenancy in common. Yes, you can you can partially convert a portion of a property from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. And by the way, I mean it, it, it's a lot of work. You're going to have to go and convey that property, a portion of it, to at, at the county, right? And then you're also going to have to get an appraisal every year that you do a conversion, because the value of that property changes every year to determine taxation. Publication 568 from the IRS says that if any tax taxable taxation or value is exceeds 5,000, it requires an appraisal. So, I mean, so it's it's expensive, cumbersome, but yet the, the fruits to fruits to it moving forward may be something that you might want to consider if, if it's worth it for you. Yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, yeah, can you incrementally convert an asset by re-registering? a portion of it and paying the tax incrementally? The answer is yes. You can do it in kind. That's that's the term for it. Can I do an in-kind conversion of a portion of my asset from a traditional separate simple to a Roth? The answer is yes, you can. But, you, but be prepared again to pay the tax on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and all the other ancillary things like how do I get the value of this thing? And I also have to go to the county to be able to re-record a portion of that that property from one one title to another. Yeah. But it's doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Next, uh, just a quick recap or uh, refresh your question is what is the income threshold beyond which one cannot make a Roth IRA contribution? So looking back at those income limits. Yeah, I mean it, it's one of the one of the slides that we have in there, and mm -hmm. and and um, I'm, I'm, I don't remember all the 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 numbers at this point, but yeah, just. Well, publication 590 is a good place to look, right? Publication 590 will provide for you the modified adjusted gross income limits for contributing to a Roth for tax year 2023. And please know that uh, we are sending out a follow-up email with the presentation, as well as loading the replay with the presentation for download and viewing with all this information as well. So please find it there um, at your will. Thank you. Next question. Can I convert my 401k to a Roth IRA after 60 years of age? Uh, the, the answer to that is yes. As a matter of fact, some people who are approaching, you know, getting, of course, we're all getting older every year, right? Some people are saying, you know what, at age 73, if, 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 if I keep my assets in a 401k plan, 
I'm going to have to take out a required minimum distribution of my pre-tax dollars and so on and so forth. Well, if I, if I convert that amount from my 401k plan to a Roth IRA, then I would stop the RMDs while I'm alive. And the answer is yes. That That's a strategy some people do is they take their 401k plan. They may roll it into a traditional IRA and then incrementally convert that to a Roth so that when they reach age 73, there's no more RMDs. So your, your, your question, can I convert my 401k plan uh, to a Roth IRA? Number one, you have to have a trigger. You have to know when you take money out uh, to take, when can you, you can take money out of your 401k plan as your plan administrator. But if you are retired, that answers that question, right? You can move your 401k plan to your Roth, absolutely, and do a conversion. Yeah, there, there's a lot of benefits to that. Yeah. Thank you, JP. But be prepared to pay the taxes. So that, that's the main thing I tell people. Mm -hmm. Great. Next. Just to clarify, if I do the conversion, then do I pay the tax from the traditional account or can I pay separately? And if I can pay separately, then is that amount taxed as well? Um, okay, so so when you when you're doing a conversion, let's say of a hundred thousand, right? And you can you convert that hundred thousand from the traditional to the Roth, the tax on that would have to come out of your own pocket, right? The tax on the amount that you 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 um, the, the amount that you're converting is going to be subject to a tax. And if you pay out that out of pocket, I hope you have enough money to pay the tax on that. That amount of tax that's paid towards that hundred thousand is not taxable again because that's out of your pocket, right? So it's just so happens that what the, the question is, do you have to convert the whole thing from the traditional to Roth? Or can you pay a portion of that out of the conversion to pay the tax on that conversion? The answer is, again, as I mentioned before, it is not advisable to take the tax out of your distribution to convert because that amount was not converted. When you, you take money out of the, the distribution for the conversion, that goes to Uncle Sam. So it never hits your Roth, all right? So if you're going to do a conversion, it is highly recommended. Not necessarily that's the, the only thing you can do. If you're going to convert, convert the whole thing. Determine whether or not you can pay it. And if you have the money out of your pocket, pay the tax from, from that instead of from your distribution. Yeah. Thank you, JP. Quick question next. Are conversions to Roth IRAs considered as distributions? The answer is yes, it is. Because um, Uncle Sam says, you know, if you have dollars in an account that's never been taxed before and you wanted to con convert that and distribute it and put it in a Roth so you, you won't get taxed on that ever again, well, there's taxation. The taxation is derived from the distribution that you took from your traditional or SEP or simple, correct? Thank you, JP. Next. Um, back to valuation of existing LLC interests, can the valuation take typical discounts for minority interest and lack of control? And that would be something that you need to discuss with your tax advisor uh, from a tax perspective. And that's why we always say work with your tax advisor because we don't we don't offer tax advice. So that would be more of a tax advice issue. Yeah. Thank you, JP. Next. Can I still convert my standard IRA to a Roth IRA if I am not working and not getting a W-2? I think we covered this, but just want to answer there yeah, directly. The, the answer is you can convert. You just can't make a contribution. Conversion and contributions are two separate things. So even if you don't have earned income, can you take your money out of your you know, traditional raw, traditional SEP or simple and convert that to raw? Yeah, you don't need to have earned income to do a conversion. Earned income is only required when you're trying to make a contribution. So... Yes, you can convert even though you don't have earned income, right? Thank you, JP. Next, if I have a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k, mm -hmm. can I take 10k from each as a first-time home buyer? No, the lifetime limit, however, is 10,000 for all your Roths. So great. And so by the way, and by the way, uh, first-time home purchase uh, to to take tax-free distributions from your 401k plan is not is not the same. The qualified distribution of the 401k plan is five years and death, disability, and attainment of 59 and a half. As you can see, I never I didn't I didn't say pur purchase of a first time home. The first time home criteria to distribute earnings tax free is only found on the IRA world. So if you want to take a distribution and you want to use it to purchase first time home, right? Do it in your IRA 
not your 401k plan because 401k plan qualified distributions for first time home is not existent. So great note. And that actually rolls into um, if there's anything else you want to expound on, this next question is what is the difference between Roth 401k compared to Roth IRA? All right. One of the main differences, number one, is take a look at contributions, right? When you're making a contribution to a Roth IRA, everybody knows that there is a, an income limit. In a Roth 401k plan, there is no income limit. So if you wanted to contribute, let's let's say you work for yourself and you don't have any employees, and then and then you set up an individual 401k plan with the Antrust Group, and you want to make a, a contribution called a deferral, assuming of course you have enough income to support it, right? The maximum uh, uh, Roth 401k contribution this year is twenty three thousand five hundred, and if you're fifty and older, you can make an additional. I'm sorry, it's not 23, it's 22,500 with an additional $7,500 catch up contribution if you're 50 and older. In other words, a total of 30,000 if you're 50 and older. Again, it's assuming that you enough, have enough earned income to support it. There's no income limit in a Roth 401k plan. In a Roth IRA, there are income limits. Okay, so that's one main difference. <clears throat> Another difference is that. Uh, for distribution purposes, which I alluded to earlier, if you want to take a tax-free distribution from your Roth 401k plan, you must have had a Roth 401k, Roth 401k plan for five years. And to qualify for a qualified distribution criteria, you must be 59 and a half dead or disabled. Pur purchase of a first-time home is not a qualified distribution criteria in the 401k plan, whereas in, an, in a Roth IRA, it is. Another difference. In a Roth 401k plan, when you reach age 73, for this year, this is the last year, that amount is includable in calculating your required minimum distribution. Whereas in a Roth IRA, you don't have required minimum distributions while you're alive. Thank God next year, starting in 2024, Roth, uh, Roth buckets or Roth contributions made to a Roth 401k plan are no longer subject to required minimum distributions there's a lot a lot more differences between the two but those are the those are those are generally the main points of what makes a Roth 401k plan different than a Roth IRA if you're rich and you have a business and you don't have any employees uh, an individual 401k plan would be you know a, a solution for you and could, because you can contribute uh, to a Roth uh, 401k plan even if you make even if you make a lot of money all right so I hope that answers your question. Thank you, JP. A couple more here. Next, following up on IRA to Roth conversion, is there a wait time for the IRA before having or being able to do the conversion? No, uh, if, if there, there is no wait time. Uh, some people actually make a contribution to their SEP plan, which the contributions go into a traditional IRA or to make an annual contribution and then later on convert it right away. You, you can do that right away. There is no, there's no time frame. I wish they say, you know, 0.011111 seconds. I'm trying to be funny <laughs> here, but I'm not. You don't have to wait. You, you can make that contribution and then convert that right away. The taxation is something that you're going to have to discuss with your tax advisor because there's a lot of moving parts behind that your tax advisor can walk you through it. But you can make a contribution and convert it right away, especially if you make too much money to be able to contribute to a Roth. That's what we call the backdoor Roth, yeah. Or at least that's what the industry calls it now because somebody came up with a great marketing term. Right. Great, thank you, JP. Next, can a deferred annuity be converted to a Roth IRA? Okay, not all annuity products are retirement plan products. In other words, uh, deferred annuity, unless it's an IR annuity, and that's something that you're going to have to check with your insurance company because in, in 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 regular deferred annuities, you, you don't get a deduction for the contribution because it's just an annuity, right? So although it kind of has the same similar characteristics to an IRA, but it's not, right? So make sure that it's an IR annuity and they'll be able to tell you based on the, the information that's, that's slapped onto the writer of that annuity, whether or not it's an IR annuity or, or not. If it's an IR annuity, that can be converted to a Roth. But if it's just a regular deferred annuity and it's not an IR annuity, that cannot be converted to a Roth because it's not a retirement product. Thank you. According David. to the code, ma'am. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah. cool. two more here. Next, can I count the conversion as part of an RMD for the year? 
Uh, RMDs cannot be converted. So in other words, if you want to do a conversion, you're subject to RMDs, you have to take the RMD first and then convert the remaining portion. So in other words, you cannot count that for your RMD. So there's two, you have to satisfy the RMD and, and convert the rest after you've satisfied your RMD. And, and in a distribution calendar year, in other words, uh, um, January 1st to December 31st, first dollars leaving your IRA counts as an RMD first. So in other words, if you're taking a distribution, unless you've satisfied it someplace else, that has to satisfy your RMD first before you can convert the remaining portion. Great. Thank you, JP. Very clear. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question for now. So if anyone else has any more questions, please get them in now so JP can answer them before we wrap up. But without further ado, last question here. If I invest in real estate using my Roth IRA, can I still depreciate the real estate to lower my taxes for my earned income? The answer is no. Yeah, you, Uncle Sam says you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, when you invest in rental property, as an example, you can use depreciation to depreciate that. But there's also some tax consequences later on when you decide to sell the property. If it's under an IRA, it's like Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. There's a lot of the benefits that you're going to get outside of an IRA cannot be acquired in an IRA. Because keep in mind, you're already receiving preferential tax treatment for, for having it under the umbrella of an IRA. The income of that is not taxable. So therefore, depreciation does not really help on the income as an example of that rental property. So depreciation, it, it, it's, it's not even an, it's not even a, a variable that comes into play, right? And in a Roth IRA, later on, once you've had a Roth of five years and you attain 59 and a half, as an example, everything's tax-free. So Uncle Sam says you can't have your cake and eat it too. So even though you can depreciate, uh, let's say, investment properties outside of a retirement plan, you can't do that inside of a retirement plan. All right. Thank you, JP. And we are at the end of questions. Nothing else came in. So if you want to send us home, that'd be wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, folks. And if you, you have any further questions, uh, please send them in to um, Andrew. Could be a good point of contact for you. And uh, we can we still add, it doesn't have to stop right here, but we're just running out of time. So if you do have questions, please bring them in. And if you are interested in another uh, interest group uh, webinar, educational webinar, please please let us know if you're interested and if you're interested in any topics as long as we can actually deliver that particular topic we'll be more than happy to um uh, provide that webinar for you um on behalf of the Entrust group my name is john paul ruiz thank you for attending today's webinar and hope to see you again soon